All right, let's try that again. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Community Health Improvement Week. My name is Desiree Della Torre, and I'm the Director of Community Affairs and Population Health Improvement within CHI, the Child Health Advocacy Institute. This week, we have been featuring many Community Health Improvement Week, excuse me, Community Health Improvement Activities. And I like to know, do our folks know what the Child Health Advocacy is and what it's all about? Yeah. All right, that's good. When we started on Monday, we didn't have that much response. So it's good to see that the education about the work that we're doing is, um, be, we're, we're all learning about it, and we have a great lecture today. So I'd like to tell you what Community Health Improvement Week is all about. Community Health Improvement Week is a nationally recognized event to raise awareness and increase understanding of community health improvement activities, like programs led by our community health centers, briefings for legislators, and strategies that address the need of our community. The week's events are led by the Child Health Advocacy Institute, or CHI, and CHI believes that improving our patient's health does not stop when a patient leaves the hospital. CHI works to combat the most pressing health problems in the region through advocacy and policy. Thank you for participating in, in all of the community health improvement activities this week and this lecture culminating the week's event. Today's lecture is a very important lecture. Children's National envisions a school health system, a school-friendly health system designed to help all children reach optimal and achieve an optimal health and achieve their fullest academic potential. Many of you have participated in some of the stakeholder groups to create the school health report that Children's National has put together. It uh, has many of the programs that our, our organization is doing within schools. And today we have, who we've been working very closely with, Dr. Heidi Schumacher. Many of you know Dr. Heidi Schumacher. Uh, <laughs> she was a resident and a chief resident here at Children's National. And Dr. Heidi Schumacher will describe the impact of educational achievement on long-term health outcomes, analyze the whole school, whole community, whole child framework, and apply it to a patient case as it is for prop rounds, and reflect on the role of pediatric clinicians in advancing the holistic health and wellness for children, including in the school setting. A little brief bio about Dr. Heidi Schumacher. She is a general pediatrician here at Children's National and the Deputy Chief of Student Wellness at DC Public Schools. In her role at DCPS, she oversees student health and wellness services, accommodations for students with medical needs, and Medicaid reimbursement. Dr. Schumacher currently serves on the Executive Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on School Health and as co-chair of the School Health Committee of the DC chapter of the AAP. Prior to coming to DC Public Schools, she was a medical officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, where she worked on healthcare delivery system reform under the Affordable Care Act. Dr. Schumacher is a graduate of Duke University and the University of Vermont College of Medicine. She completed her residency and chief residency at Children's National Health System, and she continues to practice clinically in the Goldberg Center for Community Pediatric Health. Please give us, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Heidi Schumacher. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Desiree, for that very kind introduction. It is such an honor. It's very humbling to be invited to speak here, especially in Community Health Improvement Week, and especially on a topic that, that I feel so passionate about and that I know many of you feel passionately about as well. Uh, first, I have no disclosures. Uh, and as Desiree just introduced, we'll talk today about a lot of different angles of the intersection of health and education, but I hope at the end of the discussion today, you'll each be able to walk out of this room understanding the impact of educational achievement on long-term health We'll also spend a lot of time talking about the converse, the impact of health on education and the role of shared social determinants of health. We'll analyze a framework for connecting our two sectors to support holistic health and well-being, including in the school setting. And we'll, throughout the hour, reflect on the role of each and every one of you as pediatric clinicians in advancing holistic health and wellness for our patients. And as a former chief resident who spent quite a bit of time talking and working on prof rounds, I've reflected uh, on sort of the structure and the context for this discussion. As you know, it's sort of a hybrid grand and prof rounds. Um, but in the spirit of prof rounds, which really focuses on diagnostic dilemmas, we may not talk about molecular pathophysiology and have Dr. Agarwal, a now full professor, I just learned. <laughs> 
recite from memory every single clinical guideline that's ever been published in the history of time. But, but to me, this is a diagnostic dilemma, too, both on an individual patient level and on a systems level of how health impacts education and vice versa. And so with that, we will start on our patient case. So we have, for our case, a 13-year-old obese Hispanic female presenting to clinic after being jumped at school by three girls who called her fat. She acknowledges that this is the second episode of physical violence, lots of other episodes throughout the year of emotional abuse, and she says she was punched in the upper torso and extremities. Her past medical history is significant for obesity and ADHD. She's not on any medications. Stimulants had been recommended, but mom had declined. And on social history, she says, you know, I just hate school. I just don't like it. My teachers are all out to get me. She's in eighth grade and started a new school this year and just has not had a good experience. And her review systems is generally unremarkable. She denies loss of consciousness or any concussive symptoms, no neuro symptoms, just really acknowledges some pain on her right upper arm and fist where she punched and was punched. Her exam is significant for obesity. She's alert and oriented, interactive, and again, otherwise relatively unremarkable, other than a slight bruise in that same area where she has pain. And so this is a case about health and education, so many different directions we could take this case, but I'd love to start by asking Dr. Wiener, one of our wonderful pediatric residents, who's actually just about to start a week, uh, sorry, a month of her advocacy rotation with us at DC Public Schools, um, to reflect on what she sees as the health conditions or health concerns that might have educational impact in this kiddo. Um, so I would be worried about bullying, untreated ADHD, um, disliking her teachers, and um, her nutritional deficiencies with the obesity. And she's definitely at risk for emotional harm, poor school performance, and truancy. Fabulous. It's almost like I paid you to say that. <laughs> so, Dr. Wiener, yes, I am totally on the same page with you. So what I see is some of the health concerns in this kiddo, ADHD and obesity, uh, which goes along with nutritional and physical activity um, deficiencies often, as well as that bullying, the aggression and violence in school. Perfect. And so we have colleagues here from psychology, and I'd love to ask Dr. Atmore from psychology, can you help us reflect on how those health conditions, what the mechanism might be for which we would see educational impact in this kid? Let me stand up. I'll stand up. Um, so for this case and uh, every case I see, it's backtracking to find out whether there's a, a pre-existing learning disability that was never diagnosed. So the fact that she hates school and across the board doesn't like going to school uh, means that there's probably something in her early history that's an impediment to learning. So we would want to clarify that for her. And then with the current injuries, even though she's not reporting symptoms, she may be symptomatic for post-concussion syndrome, we don't really know what her uh, traumas have been, so need to watch out for that too, and headaches and sleep problems, um, and then get her involved in a obesity clinic program. That's Perfect. It. Thank you, Dr. Atmore. Okay. And actually, on that note, we have Dr. Kenningsberg here from endocrinology. And Dr. Kenningsberg, can you reflect on what you see as some of the link between obesity and educational impact? Yeah, so obesity is, is definitely a, a tough situation because it's easy enough for them to come to clinic. We give them a list of 10 different things that they have to do, and then they come back in three months, and then we sometimes get or frustrated or feel frustrated that no changes have been made. And I think that this case really points out the importance of kind of understanding what's going on in a patient's environment, um, specifically what's going on when they're in school because they spend a lot of their day in school. Um, but it really underlines the fact that until we kind of uh, have her meet with psychology, that's probably the first thing I would do if I saw her in clinic, um, and, and try to get more at what's going on and kind of what her eating behaviors are and what's driving her to eat. Um, we need to really address that before we can focus on obesity. I mean, we would definitely be worried about diabetes in this patient, um, but the first thing would to be kind of learn a little bit more about her home environment and, and where we can make changes to try to help her um, make healthier lifestyle changes. But that won't work until we have her see psychology and, and start to understand what's going on at home. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so you all touched on a lot of the same concepts um, that I flagged here. But importantly, what you all find that I did not talk here is that there is many of these kids, again, have parallel comorbidities, often which precede the issues like bullying, obesity, et cetera, and may even cause them, and some of those shared social determinants. 
The other things that I have up here are the impact on sensory perception. So we know that many kids with ADHD often have difficulty with visual processing and visual motor integration. On the cognition side, with any of these conditions, but especially ADHD and the aggression and violence, we see impact on memory, on attention. Uh, there can be sleep disturbances that impact ability to, to have good cognitive function during the day. And then on the obesity side, too, we know that nutritional deficiencies and micronutrient deficiencies can cause difficulties with cognition. We also know that kids who aren't getting physical activity don't have the benefit of that physiologic change in the brain that we see with physical activity on a regular basis. Poor school connectedness is something that Dr. Wiener flagged for us at the beginning. So oftentimes these kids who are acting out in school who don't feel safe at school uh, and those who are obese, they may overall feel less well, uh, less confident in themselves and in their relationships, less likely to have complex peer networks, and also often have a strong, uh, that, that those behavioral challenges can have a strong impact on their relationship with their teachers. And so just like in our patient, they may be less likely to have a trusted adult in the school building. And finally, all of that can impact absenteeism. And so we, we've all, you know, we see this kid, we reflect, we identify that this kid has a risk for educational failure or challenge. We've identified in our brain some of these potential causal pathways. And so we ask, you know, what's going on with your grades? And she tells us that she used to get Bs, and now this year in particular, she's really getting almost all Bs and Fs. And so Dr. Felucci is here from the Goldberg Center and from CHI. And Dr. Felucci, I'd love for you to help us reflect on what questions you might ask to dig further into why we might be seeing some of this educational impact. Uh, sure. So one of the, some of the things that first came to mind, we sort of already addressed. So absenteeism, how, how often is she out of school and what's causing some of that? How are these potential mood disorders actually manifesting in school, difficulty concentrating, um, family involvement? Um, you mentioned that she's Hispanic. I mean, I guess she's been here for at least a year, but mm -hmm. we don't know really how long. We know yep. we see more bullying in kids who are more recent arrival, um, oftentimes even being bullied by other kids of the same ethnicity. Um, ADHD, I think we often see as being really a mimicker of other things. So again, digging more deeply into you know, the mood disorders, anxiety, depression, um, what supports does she have at home, at school, outside. Perfect. I could go on. Yeah, great. <laughs> right. A million different ways we could take this. But yes, I agree. What I flagged here is potential questions, attention and engagement in class. You talked about that. When we asked this kiddo, she says, I just don't like school. No one cares about me in class anyway, and so I often just don't pay attention. She also acknowledges being sleepy in school. On the second question, again, poor sleep at home. She often goes to bed really late at night, um, wakes up late in the morning, rarely uh, acknowledges eating breakfast. She says in the last week she's eaten breakfast twice um, and denies any regular physical activity. She says she tried out for the dance team but uh, quit during the tryout process because kids were making fun of her for being fat. Uh, denies any trusted adults in the school building um, and says she has a few acquaintances, but none that she really trusts on a regular basis. Um, and says the only thing that she likes about school is that sometimes snack is good. Um, and, and acknowledges missing days of school, a couple days of school at least per month because of concern about her safety um, outside of other days of school that she's missing for other illnesses, et cetera. And so in the clinic setting, Dr. Wiener, let's take it back to you. Uh, what would be your assessment and plan uh, in the management of this patient? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the bullying and emotional distress, I definitely want to talk to the guidance counselor, social worker, and her teachers at school and also see if the mom has spoken to them yet. I, mean, I think we really need to help mom figure out how to advocate for her daughter and then obtain, as other um, attendings have said, like to obtain counseling services through the school or like the DC MAP program to get her like immediately connected. Um, and in terms of her ADHD, I think we need to get like an educational evaluation. Like she might need an IEP for school or some accommodations with a 504 plan. And then in terms of the obesity, I'd also want to check for food insecurity and asking like why she's not eating breakfast during the day. Is it because she's insecure or do they not have access to the resources? and then actually plan to do more of like a thorough assessment of her obesity at the next visit since I think she's already under enough distress right now. Um, and then at my clinic, we have Next Force, which is a program for nutrition, exercise, and self-esteem that Dr. Dudley runs, which I think she would really benefit from. And then also just make sure to follow her really closely, like weekly until she's connected to services. 
Perfect. I love it. And I think you touched on a variety of different elements, obviously many different conditions happening in parallel with this kiddo. But what I especially like that you said was talking about resources in the clinic setting, but also really trying to do outreach through the family and even potentially directly with colleagues in the school setting who may also be providing resources in parallel. That's great. So I like this case for a lot of reasons. One, because it's a real case, um, someone that I saw relatively recently in clinic. Um, but two, because I think it highlights, one, how common many of these issues are. I think if we put this case in any of your clinics, uh, you would probably say you've seen a similar patient in the recent past. Uh, the other thing that I like is that it highlights importantly, and we'll dig into this more in the discussion, the role of the clinic setting, but also the importance of those connections which Dr. Wiener tied up, teed up nicely for us in terms of um, looping back with the school. So stay tuned, we'll come back to this. So, so why are we talking about health and education? Why was the CHI team so kind to think about this as a topic that would be relevant for discussion today? And the reason why I think it's such an important topic for us as child health providers to talk about is because of this sentence, which I absolutely love, and is sort of the mantra of the AAP Council on School Health also, um, by Dr. Elders, who's a pediatrician and public health expert. You cannot educate a child who is not healthy, and you cannot keep a child healthy who is not educated. So if we have a mission not only to treat individual health conditions of our kiddos that we see in clinic, but also really think about our goal for them as being healthy, happy, productive adults, we must acknowledge and address the role that educational attainment plays there. The other thing, what, the other reason why I think this is such an interesting topic is because we in the health space are increasingly taking this holistic view about our kids' health and well-being and thinking about the whole child as opposed to elements of the child. The education sector is doing much the same thing. And you can see that in very similar mission and purpose statements. So the AAP, as an example, is an organization committed to the optimal physical, mental, and social health and well-being for all children. Children's National aims to lead the nation in advancing the health and well-being of all children. Note, not the medical care of children, but their health and well-being. And as Desiree mentioned earlier in her introduction, the School Health Collaborative here has even posed a step further that children's is a school-friendly healthcare system designed to help all children reach optimal health and achieve their fullest academic potential. That's a strikingly holistic uh, view of the role of the health system in advancing holistic health and wellness. And then on the education side, we see much the same thing. So DC Public School mission, and this is from a number of years ago too, is to prepare all students for success in college, career, and in life. Not just testing scores, not just attendance, but success in life. And so we may use different words here, but I'd argue we're really coalescing around the same principle, which is holistic health and well-being in the whole child. We also, importantly, share many of the same social determinants with the education sector. So you all could probably rattle off in 30 seconds a million different social determinants that you struggle to really address in, in the clinic setting, they're the same ones that the, the education sector struggles to, to help address. Poverty, physical environment, so safe, violent-free communities with in good environmental health, so good air quality, et cetera. Institutional racism, the principle that, that moves certain racial and ethnic groups into areas of concentrated poverty, where the data shows even after controlling for confounding factors, those kids are less likely to succeed in their health or their education. All of that relates to the availability of and access to resources. So on the health side, we might think of those as health insurance, a primary care doctor, but that also relates to access to a good school, educational enrichment, also transportation, food, good food access, all things that relate to the overall health and well-being of a child and a family. And then, of course, the role of family and parental engagement and educational achievement not just for health literacy, which is what we often think about in the health space, but also really understanding the issues at play with the child's struggles and knowing how to help support that kiddo. And again, I'm sure many of the folks in this audience could come up with others. It's also a timely conversation because both sectors are taking a really a wider view through their reform efforts. So Desiree mentioned, I came to DCPF from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which really focuses on payment reform for our our country's public insurance systems. So I'd be remiss if I didn't show this slide, but I think it speaks to the concept of our insurance, our friends in the insurance industry, but also our the health system sort of as a whole, 
moving away from just saying we can't just provide a service. We have to instead pay for and incentivize high quality and high value care, and not even just for an individual health condition, but rather, especially as we move into this category in three and especially category four, we have to incentivize health systems to support the, the population health. So that's a really holistic view of what that means, and I would argue increasingly incentivizes us to understand and act on the role that educational attainment plays. The education sector is also taking a wider view through reform efforts. So this woman on the left, you, many folks in the audience may recognize Michelle Ree, uh, was the chancellor of D.C. Public Schools about 10 years ago, a polarizing figure in education reform for sure. But she really transformed the discussion about what the role of a school is in providing excellent evidence-based quality instruction and curriculum, but also the role that schools play in supporting the whole child. And this is a quote from, from a professor at Columbia who's an education expert and education researcher. And I'm gonna just read this because I think it's really telling for where the education space is now and thinking about the role of health. Healthier students are better learners. Recent evidence provides compelling evidence for the causal role that educationally relevant health disparities play in the education achievement gap. This is why reducing these health disparities must be a fundamental part of school reform. That is a quote from an educator, not a physician, not a nurse, not a social worker, an educator saying if we're gonna close this vexing achievement gap in the academic space, which is certainly very present in DC, uh, that we have to address the role of health. And our new chancellor here at DCPS, the gentleman in the middle, Antoine Wilson, a fabulous guy who just came to us this winter from Oakland. He's known as a national expert in social emotional learning. And I see heads in the audience um, nodding. And this is a, a, an opinion piece in the Washington Post from January from an education leader who said if Chancellor Wilson's gonna be successful in DC, he needs to collaborate with community organizations and families to support and develop the whole child from social emotional learning to nutrition. Again, these are, this is educator speak, not health speak. And finally, even the federal government's catching up. The Every Student Succeeds Act, which was placed several years ago in No Child Left Behind, introduces for the very first time accountability metrics for schools related to their support of the whole child. So one could rationally and optimistically say, oh my gosh, this is so great. All these incentives in place from all angles, lots of passionate people who are well-intentioned. This is a perfect opportunity for us to move this conversation forward. And I agree with you, it is. But the truth is the reality is too often we do so in silos, and many of us can reflect on this in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, but I'll say I've been struck almost every day since coming to DCPS of how often I learn about some new amazing thing the education space is doing to support student health and well-being that I never knew existed, and I suspect many folks in the audience don't know exist. And so I'd argue the real opportunity is for us to bridge these silos. And so how do we do that? Well, we'll talk about a variety of frameworks for bridging those silos. But first, we're gonna talk about some very cool data. I will say, too, I have about 12 billion hidden slides in this presentation, and if anyone is interested in talking more, getting references or other information, I'd love to, to chat further. And we'll start with the data on, uh, sort of building on what the case presented. So the role of health conditions in the educational um, space. And so again, just to reiterate, students with poor health are more likely to experience academic challenges and failure. And you started to talk through some of those potential causal pathways. Many of this work has really been led by this gentleman, Charles Bosch at Columbia, who has a paper out um, from 2010 that's phenomenal um, if folks are interested in looking into it further. But he proposed five buckets of causal pathways of how these health conditions can, can lead to academic challenges and failure. And again, many of these were ones that we talked about in the case. And, and what he poses is that these health conditions that can lead to academic failure or be associated with it, um, he calls them educationally relevant health disparities, or those that impede motivation and ability to learn. And in his paper in 2010, which is a meta-analysis of, of sorts, he identified seven disparities that are particularly prominent for urban minority youth, which of course is a relevant population for us here in DC. And he used three criteria to identify these seven, the prevalence of the disease in, uh, or the condition in impacting urban minority youth, the, the robustness of the data linking that uh, condition to educational outcomes, 
And finally, um, the feasibility of school health programs to address that health concern. So he came up with seven. We'll talk with a no about a number of these today, in particular those that, uh, that were relevant for our case. And so this one is the only one that's not relevant for our case that we'll start with, but it's asthma. Um, and why talk about asthma? Well, one, it's Children's National and Dr. Teach is here. Um, but also we know that this is a condition that's so prevalent in our community and also that has really robust data in terms of its connection to academic outcomes. So you all see this in your clinical practice. 20% of kids overall in D.C. have asthma, significantly higher rates among our African-American youth, um, and significantly higher rates among those living in poverty. And we can see actually that maps out beautifully here. So these are maps from DC Action for Children's website. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with that, but it's a phenomenal source of data and very cool maps that I will tell you, you can spend many hours digging yourself into. Um, and if you look on the left, you'll see absolute number of asthma-related ER visits for children, uh, with darker numbers being higher. On the right, we can see percentage of kids living in poverty with darker numbers being higher. And if we look down here, especially in wards seven and eight, um, but also a bit in wards one and four, we can see that the areas where we see hotspots of, of asthma-related ER visits for children are many of the same areas, especially down here in ward eight, where poverty is very prevalent. This, in seven and eight, that's also where we see the highest percentage of kids um, who are African-American. And so it speaks to sort of that intersection of the racial and ethnic uh, disparities as well as the socioeconomic. And why does this link exist? So the research um, is broad on this, but ultimately um, settles into primarily these three buckets. So cognition. Interestingly, a lot of this relates to the impact on sleep, the nocturnal asthma symptoms causing daytime tiredness. Connectedness, a lot of this relates to what our folks at the beginning of the discussion spoke about in terms of emotional comorbidity and some of those difficulties then with um, connecting with peers and teachers. And finally, absenteeism for obvious reasons. And so this data is very exciting, hot off the presses as of literally a few days ago, um, with many thanks to the DCPS data and strategy team. So we looked at kids identified in the universal health certificates, those, those school health forms that you all spend so much time filling out that really do matter. Um, at those kids identified with asthma, and we compared them against their peers without chronic conditions on the UHC um, in terms of their academic performance. And you can see that all of these acronyms that you've never heard of are all um, standardized testing that we do at DCPS as well as the AP and SAT exam. And each of those red triangles represents an area in which the kids with asthma are underperforming compared to their peers. Interestingly, attendance did not show up as being negatively impacted across this whole population. But as we started to do some early subgroup analysis, kids with asthma who have 504 plans, who I suspect are also those with more severe asthma, do, we do see a statistically significant decrease in attendance. So more to come on that. And if we look at these PARC scores, which are the primary annual um, standardized test that we do, we can see if we map back against the asthma-related ER visits, especially down here in seven and eight, and also a bit in wards one and four, where we see more asthma-related ER visits, we also tend to see lower performance on the park in both math and reading. So now let's move on to a few of the other chronic conditions, especially those that were relevant for our case. So ADHD was one that was flagged by each of our colleagues here in answering questions, and it's obviously relevant for our case. So ADHD, the most common mental and behavioral health problem in youth, Causal pathways, many of these we really talked about in the case. Um, dropping out is a really interesting one, too. Kids with ADHD are 2.7 times more likely to drop out than their peers. And when we look at the DCPS data, we see this play out. So these are kids, um, we use terms here including ADD, ADHD, hyperactivity, and a variety of other very interesting terms that end up on the Universal Health Certificate, um, but that we think are in the same family. And we see across the board, those pink um, triangles are statistically significant lower achievement compared to their peers on all of our academic measures and on attendance. How about aggression and violence? This kiddo was, was experiencing bullying, and we know that aggression and violence can play out in many different ways in the school setting, from bullying to gang violence, physical activity, homicide, et cetera. 
Many of you who are familiar with the ACEs study, yes, Adverse Childhood Experiences, know that kids in D.C. are twice as likely as their peers across the country to experience violence. 17% um, of kids in D.C. on the ACEs survey um, were found to have witnessed or experienced violence, and we're actually the, that makes us the, the highest rate of experiencing violence of any state in the country. Um, and what I think is really interesting about a lot of the research with aggression and violence is that um, more so than some of the other educationally relevant health disparities, aggression and violence is, is found to impact teachers, really, as much as it does students. And so this is one example, uh, 13 years ago or so, 12 years ago, a national survey of high school principals showed that almost one in five had experienced uh, student acts of disrespect for teachers and almost one in 10 verbal abuse for teachers. So this relates back to that school connectedness pathway, right? If, if you feel you're being abused in the classroom, it's really hard to be empathetic with your students. It's also, I would argue, hard to be a really effective teacher if you're feeling personally threatened um, in addition to witnessing that violence in your students. And so the Youth Risk Behavior Survey here in D.C., I think probably many of you are familiar with this, the most recent um, administration in 2015, this is also new data hot off the presses, we see that many of our kids are undergoing bullying. And if we come back to our case, a middle school female, we'll see that our patient is in good company, unfortunately, with her peers. 35% of middle school females reported having been bullied on school property, 27% of middle school males. Lower rates in high school and with electronic bullying, but still pretty significantly high across the board. And this is much higher in certain subgroups, especially our LGBTQ youth. And how does this play out with causal pathways? We talked about this a bit in the case, but the literature on the impact on cognition especially relates to those emotional comorbidities, so internalizing behaviors like depression and anxiety, externalizing behaviors like aggression and hyperactivity, connectedness, which relates to feelings of safety and also the, the, the lack of complex fear networks for some of these kids being bullied, and then absenteeism, again, especially related to, to feelings of safety as well as the other um, comorbidities. And so again, back to the YRBS, we see that play out here. So if we look on the right, again, we'll speak about the demographic that reflects our patient. This gray bar is Hispanic young folks in middle school. 19% of Hispanic middle schoolers in D.C. two years ago reported having been afraid of being beaten up at school one or more times in the last 12 months. And that plays out with their, their interest in attending school as well. So again, if we look at this, this gray bar here, middle school Hispanic kiddos, 14% of them reported on the YRBS having missed one or more days of school in the last 30 days because of feeling unsafe. That statistic alone puts that kid on track to be truant or chronically absent, even if they miss school for no other reason throughout the year. And interestingly, this plays out too with um, grades. So kids with D, primarily Ds and Fs, far more likely than it appears to have been in a physical fight, to have been bullied or to bully, and to have carried a weapon. And then finally, this concept of obesity and physical activity and nutrition, significant challenges and disparities across the board. Um, again, if we look back at our patient, this is a survey from the YRBS, um, how often uh, students reported being hungry most or all of the time. That gray bar um, with the circle, 16% of Hispanic females in middle school reported being hungry most or all of the time. And if that horrifies you, it's even higher for high schoolers. 26% of Hispanic females in high school are reporting being hungry most or all of the time. And we know, too, that the minority of D.C. high schoolers get the recommended amount of physical activity, and this is um, with significant racial disparity across the city. Causal pathways, we talked about much of this in the case, cognition, connectedness, absenteeism, and dropping out. And then if we can, we can play that out as it relates to any number of academic outcomes, but here we'll look at grades specifically. So again, if we look at the dark blue columns, kids who are getting mostly Ds and Fs three times as likely as their peers to have not eaten breakfast at all in the prior week, two and a half times as likely as their peers to have gone hungry because there wasn't enough food in the home in the last 30 days. And so if you're wholeheartedly depressed, and so, or at least shocked by this data, um, you can be even more depressed as we think about the next section. Um, 
that, that we know that kids that fail out of school or have difficulty with educational attainment have long-term impact on their health. And this is where I suspect many of the folks in the audience here are particularly interested in thinking about that as we try to advance our, kid, our young people's lifelong holistic health and wellness. And the literature talks about the relationship between educational, um, educational attainment and health status, healthy lifestyle and psychological well-being. That in turn plays into lifespan, overall, uh, medical care costs, and interestingly, work productivity too. And so what is the link? There's lots of literature that poses a variety of different potential linkages. But the most common ones that the literature supports, in particular, um, there's a really nice summary of this in this paper from BCU um, with, in support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that basically says if you have a higher education, you're more likely to get a good job and have a higher income, and that gives you access to better resources, which in turn then gives you access to, hopefully, behaviors, et cetera, that puts you in a better lifelong health position. And we see that here with data in DC. So if you look in the northwest corner of the city, where the vast majority of folks have a bachelor's degree or higher, and then we look at median household income, that's where we see folks with the, the highest income. And conversely, if we look in Ward 7 and especially Ward 8, where very few folks have a bachelor's degree, much lower median income. To be clear, and residents, this should make you feel better about your salary. Um, down here in Ward 7 and 8, the majority of people there have an, a median household income in the twenty to $30,000 range. That is striking. Think about living in the city and the access to resources that you would lack if your family needs twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That in turn plays into ability of getting to a safe environment, having access to stable housing, it's violence free, et cetera. Again, down here in seven and eight, lower rates of bachelor's degrees, much higher rates of homicide and assault and mortality. And then the second link that's posed relates back to ACEs. So we know that early childhood stressors um, cause uh, kids to have um, disturbed educational progress. That relates to that, that difficulty stressful home that they might be living in. And then that also impacts their development and their neurobiology, which in turn makes them more likely to have unhealthy and risky behaviors. And we see that play out here. Um, folks with, in the white, with four year, more years of education compared to the base risk, have lower rates of chronic disease, here listed as heart disease and diabetes, lower rates of five-year mortality, and fewer sick days, which gets back to that work productivity piece at the beginning, too. And we see that here. Again, if diabetes is a chronic condition, down here in Ward 7 and 8, where fewer folks have bachelor's degrees, many more people die of diabetes than in any other part of the city. And that, of course, in turn relates to health behaviors. So again, if you look at the white bars, folks with four more years of education far less likely to smoke, to drink, to be overweight or obese, and to use illegal drugs. All of that in turn translates into changes in life expectancy. So you can see across all of these demographic groups, additional education portends significant increases in life expectancy. We see that especially with the green bar at the bottom for black males, four extra years of, of educational attainment portends about a 10-year increase in life expectancy. And what's not on the slide, but I think is just as fascinating, is if you compare life expectancy for folks without a high school diploma in the 1990s versus now, across the board, it's lower. You're less likely to have a long life expectancy now without a high school education than you were 20 years ago. And that's especially true for white women, right? Not a demographic that we often think about in terms of health disparities. White women without a high school diploma in now have a five-year lower life expectancy than white women without a high school diploma in the 90s. So increasingly, actually, the public health community is starting to say, maybe a more accurate predictor that we should really talk about, even than racial differences across life expectancy, is really differences in life expectancy across different levels of educational attainment. So I hope I've convinced you. The case is clear. Health and education are closely linked. And so now what do we do about it? Well, I'd argue, again, it gets back to the silos. We on the health side and folks in the education space are both thinking about how we can, can introduce holistic supports for our young people and are very well intentioned in doing so. But I think until we get to doing so together, we miss a real opportunity. And luckily, there are a number of frameworks through which we can really bridge that link. 
And so many of you may be familiar with the coordinated school health model. Anybody familiar with that? Global Price and Lee Beers, I know you are. Um, much of the coordinated school health model talks though about health services and a more traditional role of school health um, in, in advancing holistic health. The whole school, whole community, whole child model, which was introduced by the CDC earlier this decade, is a really transformative, much more holistic view of how we can support as the name applies, as a school community and as a full community, the holistic health and well-being of our young people. Certainly there are other models out there, but we'll talk today about the, the whole school, whole community, whole child, or WISC model. And the WISC model takes themes from the coordinated school health model, um, but it really increasingly puts, again, as the name implies, the child at the center, uh, supporting the whole child to be healthy, safe, challenged, supported, and engaged. It leverages the resources and the involvement of everyone in the school, the whole school. So not just looking at the school nurse as an example, but really saying every single person in that building is part of this. And then it acknowledges that health, learning, and the school itself, frankly, is part of and a reflection of the broader community. And therefore, you'll see around the edges that the community also, and that includes all of you, is really a critical piece of advancing holistically the health and well-being of our young people. And so if we walk through some of these elements in blue, you'll see that health services, which traditionally is, is, is interpreted as school nursing, is just one of many, many, many elements, one of 10 elements. And even there, we're taking a more holistic view, talking about care coordination, patient navigation, lots more comprehensive services in the traditional model. It includes things like mental health. If we're down here, again, in the bottom, um, in the school setting, social and emotional climate. This relates to a school building that itself looks warm and welcoming, as well as the behaviors that are expected from adults and children in the building. When your kid walks in the door in the morning, does someone greet him or her and say, Alana, it is so great to have you here in school. Um, thank you for coming today. That has a totally different impact on a kid's interest in coming to school and their confidence in their academic performance than if no one pays attention to them when they walk in the door. Physical environment also relates to not only what we just talked about with social emotional climate, but also are there playgrounds there? Is the building um, safe? Does it have lead paint all over the place, or is it a, a, a safe and supportive environment? Employee wellness we talked about in the case. Teachers must be well themselves to be good educators and supports for their students. Family and community engagement, of course, is critical. Health education, not just for the young person, but also ideally the family. And then finally, physical education and nutrition. And what I think is, is important with the WISP model is that we acknowledge, and it, again, in the title it says this, the whole community, we as a school system can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. DCPS, as an example, has supports in each of these, its tentacles in each of these domains, but we rely on many other partners to help make a successful model. In DC, we, we partner very closely with our, the Department of Health and Behavioral Health, which supports many of the domains here, especially in health services, the provision of mental health services in our buildings. DCPS itself also employs 300 mental health clinicians. Um, so every single DC public school has mental health, one or more mental health clinicians delivering services. Department of Parks and Rec, as an example, helps support our physical education and physical activity. Healthcare finance or DC Medicaid reimburses us for services and helps make this a financially sustainable model. General services and energy environment helps make sure that our buildings are safe, are beautiful, um, and are good good places for kids to spend huge portions of their day. And then we come to you, right, in the health sector. I probably could have put an arrow to every single one of these two in the health sector, but you as clinicians play a really important, critical, central role to the success of this model. Um, again, I pointed to health services, counseling, psychological, et cetera, but really you and your expertise as clinicians and as advocates are important in making this successful across the board. Of course, many other partners that I didn't list here, too. And so, Dr. Fulci, I would love to turn to you, actually, and hear your reflection. Are there components of this model that you see as really being potentially supportive for our patients? So we think back to the great assessment and plan that Dr. Wiener presented. What pieces here do you see as relevant and complementary to what we might be able to provide in the All of the above. <laughs> 
Um, I think primarily what would be, so certainly all of them, but mostly feasible. Um, I think digging deeply into what her needs are and then referring or connecting the family to as many resources as possible. So within the clinics, obviously, we can provide health services. We can do the obesity screening and um, link her with some of our internal resources, whether it's next floor, so the obesity program. Um, within nutrition, we're doing food insecurity screening now, um, seeing what their needs are and um, referring them either, again, internally to WIC or um, to social work to get them connected to SNAP, emergency food resources. Um, and then also just making sure that they know what's available in the schools, um, within physical education, health education. Um, I think we're generally trying to do a better job of ourselves connecting with the schools and, um, you know, calling teachers and speaking with uh, other school personnel. Um, family engagement, I think, is something that we can do well in the clinics, having, um, you know, families who have been coming to us for three or four generations and being able to make those connections. Um, really all of it, you know, the social emotional climate, you know, we do our mental health screening and just engaging the patient and the family also in, um, in understanding how to build resilience, not just focusing on the negative, right, but, um, but building more supports around the child. I love it. So that's exactly what I said, all of them. <laughs> um, but I think what I really liked, Dr. Felicia, that you particularly reflected on was that, and I myself am still guilty of this, even though I work for DC Public Schools, I am still learning every single day about resources that are available in the school building. And it strikes me that that for folks that don't even have the, that especially that don't have the luxury of working every single day with colleagues in the educational setting, we are missing an opportunity to leverage many of these services that are available in the building. And I would argue it's really our duty, um, and I hope we can continue this conversation, to help ensure that every clinician in D.C. understands what are the resources that are available. Um, and I'll give an example from this case. So counseling psychological services we had referred this kid for counseling and psychological services in the community, and mom was never able to get this kid there because of logistical concerns. We instead referred to counseling and psychological services in the school building, and this kid now goes regularly. That's not unheard of, right? You have probably experienced that yourself in the clinical setting. And that's just one example of the resources, I think, that are available that we can really partner on to make this a really holistic um, and integrated uh, support for our kids. So now tying it all together, so we talked about a lot of components of health and education um, and many different roles that we, we can all play and I would argue must play. So I hope what you take home today, first and foremost, that our kids' health and educational outcomes are closely linked. We know that kids with better health are better learners, and we know that kids with better education are healthier. And so I would argue if we, if we play the long game, we're not in this to make our kids feel better just today and tomorrow to have them just get over their asthma exacerbation, but instead to have them be healthier for their life. I would argue we have to identify and address educational attainment just as centrally as we do those more traditional medical components. And with that lens, I'd argue too, as the public health sector has increasingly argued, that educational disparities really are a public health concern. And of course, we have to acknowledge to do this successfully the role of shared social determinants. I'd also argue that to meet the charge of advancing our patients' holistic health and wellness, uh, we must keep education at the forefront of our clinical practice. And this is something that I reflect on every time I see patients. When I hear a kid who's being bullied, I may not in my past life have asked them, you know, how are your grades? Are you missing a lot of school? To really make that explicit intentional link. Um, or when you hear a kid that has school failure, um, it's getting D's and F's, to ask them if they're experiencing violence, aggression, et cetera, in the school building, and to think about some of those other causal pathways. That change of intentional clinical practice is similar to what the education space is increasingly talking about in keeping kids' health at the forefront. And so that introduces an opportunity for collaboration while also introducing the risk for work in silos. And so to Dr. Pelosi's point, I think us all committing ourselves to really understanding what are the resources available in the school building and helping our school colleagues understand the resources that are available in the clinic setting is a real opportunity. And so finally, this is my final rah-rah point. You as child health providers are truly uniquely qualified to advise, support, and advocate for children's holistic health and well-being in all of the settings, not only on an individual level, but also on a community level. 
And so with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much for being here and happy to take this question. I'm at UNC and I have a kid that goes to Blue and um, uh, the ER is maybe going to start uh, comprehensive screening for social determinants of health. You know, not me, just asking for a friend. Anyway, so um, is there, if, if the parent and or the child gives permission, who is the person that we would communicate with at Blue to start to coordinate um, all that kids' services and follow-up. Who's the gatekeeper? Is it the social worker at Blue Student Health Center? Is it the school social worker? Is it the guidance counselor? Who would do that? It's a great question, and, and it's a little bit of a tough one to answer because every school, um, especially not only within DCPS, but when we start to talk about the charter schools, which are really a whole different um, beast, um, they may structure their services in a different way, but I always, I think starting with the social worker, um, is a really good start. And if there isn't a social worker there who, on staff, who can help, they can, re the person that you talk to can refer you to someone else. There's a guidance counselor at every school. There are psychologists at many schools. Schools that have a school-based health center have a separate school-based health center staff, too. So I would say if you, honestly, even if you just pick up the phone and call the front desk to the school and, and say what you're looking for, they can help connect you with the right person. I'm assuming Larry has something to say. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, uh, Heidi. I'm Larry D'Angelo, uh, and, and from and from our experiences recently this year in the school, I think that one of the the things that would be terrifically helpful is is if we could identify an ombudsperson uh, for health related issues in the schools, and and I don't know if that's an existing. Uh, employee. I don't know if that's a new position. I don't know if that's redesignating the social worker. I don't know if it's empowering the the school health nurse to serve in that role. But I but I think that first of all, and and to make it clear to providers in the community that that is an entree point for us to begin to uh, access uh, some of these resources, uh, not only for the students but also for the providers who very much want to provide the best care possible. Yeah, it's a great point, Dr. D. I appreciate the, the question. I, I mean, there isn't necessarily someone from DCPS staff, but I would say every single school um, has a school nurse. And that, to me, strikes me as really the right person to start with, especially with the new school health services program model, where care coordination is a really important piece. That school nurse that exists in every single building, they one of their many roles is really to help facilitate conversations with the health sector, and so I'd encourage folks with concerns to at least start with the school nurse. If the child has a developmental disability or any kind of disability, they'll have an IEP, and that child will then have a case manager mm -hmm. that will then link to all the other resources? That's right. Yeah. Hi, Heidi. I'm Vinny Choksi. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for this great talk. I think. We're all sort of saying the same thing, but what we struggle with in clinic a lot is that we know our patients will have better success going to psychology services at their school, but we have no idea if they exist. And so should we be looking at each school's website, or how do we know what set of services exist at each school? It's a really good question. So um, there are probably some schools that have websites that include that, but that is not universal across the board. And again, I'll also say I didn't state this explicitly. D.C. Public Schools um, has an enrollment of about 48,000. Our colleagues on the charter school side have an enrollment that's almost as high. So DCPS really only captures 50 to 60 percent of the kids that you may be seeing in the clinic side. And each of the charter schools really has a very different structure, and I can't speak as much to what they have. Certainly much more variation. Um, to Dr. Rucker's point, I would say to start, um, certainly you could pick up the phone and call them, although I know that's not always that practical in the clinic setting, but it's fair feedback. I mean, and I'm happy to, to take back the, uh, the question of how we might be able to better, better advertise. The other thing to know, too, is that we at DCPS employ 300 mental health clinicians, but the Department of Behavioral Health and many other community organizations, too, provide mental health services in the building, and so even if there may not be a DCPS, 
psychologist or social worker, there is there will with the new DBH plan be a DBH provider in every building, and so that's um, there is someone in the building charged with the kids' mental health. Hi, Kathy. My perspective is coming from a lot of my HIV patients who, again, clearly have uh, health issues and are not necessarily in a lot of absenteeism and not necessarily doing well in school, trying to get them to go to colleges, like huge community colleges, another level, and then vocational training. Mm -hmm. So what is DCPS doing in terms of vocational training and internships and sort of getting to that other level of basically getting them to the point where they can have income generating career or income generating activities so they can move forward and not necessarily be shuttled into you're going to college because they just are not going to college. That's right. No, I think it's a great question. So we have a full office of college and career preparedness and they focus just as much on the career preparedness as they do college preparedness. We have a number of varied vocational trainings in particular, at certain high schools, they might have a public safety academy, for example, at Anacostia High School, hospitality academy at other schools. And so each school, every school um, that's a high school has some form of vocational training, but there is some specialty across the schools. And certainly it is a big focus because our, our intent, just like the mission statement says, is not necessarily to send every kid to college. Because we know actually many of the kids we send to college don't graduate either if they're not placed in a school that really fits their needs. And so is that all available on website or is if it you, um, I, uh, I think so. Uh, there should be. There's certainly general information, the degree to which it's linked to each individual school. I might have to check and get back to you. But there certainly is lots of information about our college and career preparedness online. We are over time, so thanks everybody so much for being here and happy to take questions later too. Thank you to all those who joined us on the special Grand Rounds for Community Health Improvement Week. We'll see you next year, and Chai is here all year long. Thank you. <laughs>